2013. My name is Simon Clark. I'm director of the Smokers Lobby Group Forest, and uh, we're organising tonight's event with the Institute of Economic Affairs. Um, I'd just like to explain that the Liberty Lounge is three back-to-back -back events. This is the first one with uh, Nigel Farage. After this, we'll be going back up into the main bar for free drinks for about 45 minutes. And then we're going to be coming back down here to the auditorium for what I hope will be an absolutely fantastic show, a stand-up comedy of about 60 minutes. And this year, uh, it features the fantastic Australian comedian Steve Hughes, who you may have seen on things like Live at the Apollo, Michael McIntyre's uh, Roadshow, and so on. And he does some fantastic routines uh, to do with the nanny state, uh, secondary smoke, health and safety regulations. Now, we did our first Stand Up for Liberty event actually two years ago, and afterwards uh, somebody tweeted that they thought it was the best fringe event at the Conservative Party for 14 years. So I do hope we can live up to that uh, tonight. I have to say, at the same time, somebody came up to me afterwards, uh, after that event, he said, ooh, he said, that was brave of you to do that. Now, I have to say, when somebody says to you, well, that was brave, you immediately start to worry. You think, what, what have we done wrong? So, uh, anyway, it should be a fantastic evening. I hope you will stay with us uh, for a drink and then come back here for Stand Up For Liberty. Now, I'm first of all going to introduce uh, the host of our first event. And uh, very quickly, uh, as you, many of you will know, uh, he's the Director General of the Institute of Economic Affairs. Now, I have to read some of these things. I can't remember all the different things he's done over, over the years. Um, but uh, he was educated at Balliol College, Oxford, where he studied philosophy, po uh, politics, and economics. He's the former campaign director of Liberty, the human rights group. He founded No to ID. In December 2004, he was appointed head of media for the Liberal Democrats. Um, <laughs> later, <laughs> now, that's, that's not meant to be part of the comedy, but uh, we'll get that to uh, later. Uh, later, he founded the think tank Progressive Vision, which is a classical liberal think tank. And as I say, he's currently Director General of the IEA, uh, which he started, I believe, in December 2009. And he's done a most fantastic job, I have to say. Uh, he's rarely uh, out of the headlines or, or off the news. You'll hear him all the time on Radio 4, Radio 5, and virtually every media outlet. Will you please put your hands together and give a warm welcome to Mark Littlewood. So then there'll be an opportunity for, for you to ask him questions. Uh, so I just want to get the conversation flowing. I'm going to ask him about a whole range of different topics. So can you join with me in welcoming our special guest for this first session of the Liberty Lounge this evening, Banquo's Ghost of the Feast. Please join me in welcoming Nigel Farage. Support. You're basically a free trade classical liberal yourself, without a doubt, and that's why I supported that. You know, I mean, I thought uh, I thought I was a conservative when I joined the party in 1978 because uh, it talked about reducing tax, which I've all forgotten. I mean, top rate tax then was 83 percent. A massive disincentive to any bright person to stay in the country. Um, so I supported that. I thought I was a conservative. I realised at the end of it I wasn't. I was more of a radical economic liberal. Um, and people say, well, what is you? You know, historically, is it left wing, right wing? Where would you put it? Actually, I think the free trade movement uh, would be something that, that, that you could have a huge amount in common with. Now, to talk a bit about lifestyle issues, that's why uh, we're here. Well, cheers, on that's that. why Lovely to see you. I asked him where the ashtray was, and apparently it's against the law now. Shocking. Shocking, I'm afraid. I have got some supplementary products that I might ask you to sample later, later on in the proceedings. Look, your character 
Nigel, the way you present yourself is, and why we call this event a beer and a fab with yeah. Nigel Farage. I um, mean, every, virtually every time I see you interviewed on television, you're either inside a pub or just outside a pub, beer in one hand, cigarette in the other. I don't think any other mainstream politicians will dare to be seen <laughs> like that. So you, you come across as a personality who you know, loves it, and uh, cigarettes, alcohol, part of your general consumption. But I'm going to press you on how much is your party in agreement with you there? You know, I, I know that when we had dinner last week, you said you were a free trade liberal. Is UKIP a kind of free trade classical liberal party, or is it just you as the leader of UKIP who was a free trade classical liberal? Well, wanting to bust out the European Union, wanting to get back control of our democracy, wanting to get back control of our trade policy so that we can you know, open up to other parts of the world, including the unanimity in UKIP. Don't give aid to third world countries, take the tariffs off their green beans and let them trade their way to prosperity. Those things run right through the party. Right, so but let's have a look on kind of personal freedoms. Um, the Licensing Act 2005, liberalising pub and bar opening hours, allowing 24 7 drinking. Possibly the greatest achievement of the last Labour government? <laughs> well, of course, um, everyone forgets that um, one of the great figures in post war British politics, who I think was in fact the leader for the longest of any political leader in the last 100 years, was of course screaming Lord Such who in his first manifesto campaigned for 24 hour ending of pubs. Uh, I, I think the old licensing laws were a nonsense. I mean, at 3 o'clock, it's back in the early 80s, at 3 o'clock, when the pubs closed, we all had memberships of these little clubs. We went down a cafe. Remember the Winchester Club in mind there? I, I was a member of a club like the Winchester. And that's where we used to have to go to get a drink in the afternoon. So I think the whole thing did need liberalising. Uh, trouble is uh, that it's led to so much social unrest uh, and unhappiness from neighbours and everything else. I don't think it's been an unqualified success. Yeah, so I was going to press you on that then. I mean, are we in favour of liberalising uh, alcohol laws or not? The Labour Party, not usually necessarily friends of personal freedom, went for it. Your own deputy leader in UKIP, Paul Nuzzle, um, said this was never going to work in Britain. The government must face the problems caused by round-the-clock drinking laws as a matter well, of... Well, we have a big drinking culture in this country. Uh, we've got the biggest alcohol problem of any country in Europe. Uh, you know, you know, I'm all for people having a drink, just in case you haven't noticed. But, <laughs> but we have a massive problem uh, with our youngsters. Uh, and it's, and it, you know, the mentality is they go out on Friday and Saturday nights with a specific intention for getting hammered. But overall, big, big but, but isn't this a kind of status scare story? I mean, overall, alcohol consumption is down. And it's been falling pretty continually since the early 1800s. So when you talk about, uh, well, you talk about sort of social unrest, isn't this just sort of people being aggrieved? I mean, the actual rates of consumption, the amount of alcohol, fuel, violence, that seems to be going down. It depends how you drink it and when you drink it. And one of the arguments, and one of the arguments Blair made, was that if we you know, had more access to opening hours, we would develop a continental cafe-style drink culture. I.e., you know, if you know it's closing at 11 o'clock, the chances between quarter past 10 and 11, you'll be banging it back as fast as you possibly can. Um, that was the theory. Uh, what is for certain, whatever they tell you about alcohol with consumption rates, behaviour caused by alcohol, not just in the cities, but in virtually every market town in England on a Friday and Saturday night, is now at epidemic levels. Right, but surely that should be tackled by arresting those people, not by actually... Well, I think that's right, and I think it's care. No, I mean, I'd agree with that, and, and through education, and, and, and there are various other ways. I, you know, I, I have to say, whether a pub is open 24 hours a day, a day or not, most of us have only got a certain amount to spend. So I don't blame you know, the current problems we've got purely on that problem. Okay, just on another couple of output issues. Uh, uh, the government was toying with the idea of bringing in a, a minimum price for units yeah. of alcohol to make sure that relatively poor people could access relatively cheap alcohol. I'm pretty sure you can oppose yeah, this, yeah. this policy. Uh, do you applaud the European Union for potentially being the leader of the board? I knew this was thank, coming. Thank, thank, thanks to the EU, they, we can still have cheap alcohol. Uh, well, no one says that the EU can't, won't make the odd decision that's the right decision. 
And the trouble is, if they make wrong decisions, well, we can't change any of them through the ballot box. I mean, that's the point. I have to say, I am against minimum pricing for alcohol. Uh, I think it would actually affect those on the lowest incomes. The worst, and it was ex Scandinavia where they taxed alcohol you know, to the most unbelievable level. What does it lead to? It leads to people having stills in the back shed, making their own alcohol, uh, and probably doing themselves more harm. Um, where else are I coming? Would you uh, would you seek to sort of roll back some of the restrictions? I mean, uh, how liberalised do you think alcohol advertising should be, for example? Uh, I mean, barely a week goes by without some other public health lobby group saying that you know you shouldn't be able to show alcohol with a positive light on television. You know, it should, you know, perhaps we shouldn't advertise it during the football in case mm -hmm. the kids are watching. Would, would you be in favour of rolling this back well, back I, to where it used to be? I I had a chat with Alistair Campbell earlier on today about this, who is somebody who had a drink problem and is now working with alcohol concern. And the one like me is not banned from the security area of the Tory conference, which is quite something that is. Um, you know, he's done his best to, for election after election to smash the Tories. And here's me just offering a bit of helpful advice to Campbell. And for some reason I'm banned, I can't fathom it. Um, frankly, uh, does uh, advertising does it increase consumption? Give people more likelihood to drink alcohol? No, probably not. I mean, most of the evidence is that what, what advertising does is make people choose between brands as opposed to choosing a drink for. So I'm not convinced by that either. But, but so would you roll back some of the restrictions? For example, you're now not prohibited to suggest that alcohol in any way leads to sexual prowess or sexual success. So alcohol advertising. Doesn't it? Okay. <laughs> I'm sure it does. I've been getting that wrong. But look where we are. But so alcohol adverts, if you like, at the moment, are, are taking on the slightly kind of nebulous abstract type of uh, sort of themes that cigarette advertising yes. took on before it was banned. You know, the Guinness adverts are sort of strange works of modern art. Would you roll that back and allow, you know, Bacardi to say, you know, or any other brand of drink to say, you know, drink this and, and you're, you're about to have a good evening? Or do you think there should be restrictions in place that should limit what, what an alcohol company can say about its product? I think we have to have some restrictions. However free market we are or not, uh, we don't want people to be completely misled. Um, although I must say, as far as advertising is concerned, I do think television is the poorer for not having the Hamlet adverts. Weren't they just fantastic? Uh, bring back the Hamlet adverts, that's what I say. Well, neatly moving on to uh, tobacco, um, uh, UKIP is in favour of repealing the smoking ban uh, in its entirety. Well, we think that actually, um, I mean, let's start at the very beginning. You know, the, the right of freedom association is actually very close behind the rights of free speech in terms of what we should be able to do and pursue in a free society. You know, I mean, if, if, if you and I, uh, Mark, want to go out tonight to our private members' club in Manchester for, I don't know, free love or whatever it might be. <laughs> I'd like you to. Uh, well, you know, I, mean, I wasn't saying we should, but if we were going to do that, that's absolutely fine. Uh, and yet we have a law that says you and I cannot buy premises uh, and set up a cigar club. So that is now against the law. And I'm astonished uh, that the Labour government went as far as that. So point number one is that private members' clubs should, within reason, be able to do what the hell they like without any interference from the state. I feel very, very strongly about that. Very strongly about that. Now, look, you know, when it comes to pubs, restaurants, uh, I think smokers, uh, in the end, possibly deserve a bit of the backlash that they got. And you know, to be honest, you're sitting having dinner uh, and the person next to you lights up. I, I can see why people objected to that. Um, but because you know, a lot of restaurants did uh, what a lot of pubs did. A lot of pubs, of course, had a saloon bar and a public bar. And the public bars where the smokers went and the saloon bar uh, was where you went for more civilised, smoke-free company. What a perfect solution that is. And I think the, the, the total smoking ban has done massive damage to the pubs and bars in this country. And if we see lots and lots of pubs closing, that's bad. Because every pub's a parliament. And it's in pubs where we actually discuss who to vote for in local elections. Uh, you know, we can go in with a view about the England football manager and get a turn around and debate in the pub. Pubs are at the heart of communities. And the smoking ban has taken away 20% of income from those parts. And I would like to see a situation where the landlord uh, can say, look, the back room 
is a smoking room. So you would, you would just so I'm clear on this, you would leave it entirely to the discretion of the landlord or the restaurant? Owner. Well, I think there's an argument that says the market can sort this out. Yeah. The market can sort this out. There are lots of people who vividly object to cigarette smoke, and I absolutely understand that. And if we believe in liberty, and we're right back to John Stuart Mill, you know, it is the right to pursue what we wish to pursue without causing detriment to others. So separate smoking rooms, it works in restaurants, it works in pubs, and certainly private members' clubs should have their own choice. Okay. And um, so the, the, the range of new restrictions that are being suggested, banning smoking in prisons, banning smoking in cars, uh, although the UK government has presently rejected uh, moving ahead with it, the plain packaging of cigarettes, yeah. like regulating what colour schemes adults are allowed to well, we've get. Got, yeah, I mean, we've got You'd this. Be all of these. We, we've got the Tobacco Products Directive updated, going through the European machinery at the moment. Uh, we're due to vote on it uh, sometime in October. October the 8th. In Strasbourg. I suspect it's going to get pushed forward again. Um, but, but before the end of the year, we will vote on it. Um, they want to ban the sale of cigarettes in packets of 10. They want to ban, so you'd, you know, you'd have to buy 20. They want to ban the selling of loose tobacco in 25 grams and mean that you have to buy it in 50. So in order to cut down on smoking, they're going to ban you buying small amounts of tobacco, so you've got to buy more. It's brilliant, isn't it? I mean, only a European commissioner could dream this up. Um, and on and on the list goes. Um, Banning menthol cigarettes, for example. Yeah, the EU's got menthol, absolutely. Um, they're going to be banned. Um, but it, 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 we, we've just reached a level, I mean, they may as well come clean and just ban it completely and then we'll just be like drug users and bark the black market because uh, we're not far away from that now and a really shocking statistic is that 80% of the hand rolling market in this country already is black market tobacco. So we are already through tobacco taxes, the exchequer is losing out hugely um, and, I, and I do, I mean back to the drugs point, I do think it quite extraordinary that we're treating smokers the way we are, whilst I bet we can walk out of here and within two or three minutes of this hall find somebody that would sell us class A drugs. I bet, I bet in the middle of Manchester that would not be a problem at all. Uh, so, I, you know, frankly, I wonder about our priorities. And uh, what, do you think, uh, what do you think the European Union Tobacco Products Directive tells us about the way the European Union is developing? Look, one could have an argument about tobacco control yeah. Uh, yes or no, how far we should go. <laughs> but why the hell is this thing debated at EU level? We had a massive consultation in the UK about whether to go over the oh, yes. The government decided no. Now, and I think with virtually no public knowledge of what's likely to be rolled out. So, uh, how symptomatic do you think this is of the way that the European Union Act on the of policy? I, I, I just think we're having a false debate in France. False debate, all, all of these party conferences, completely false debates. We still try and pretend that really, we run this country. And we get the odd little interference that comes from Brussels. The truth is, we don't. We still have our independence in foreign policy, thank goodness, you know, and that the Parliament said no to the coalition on Syria. I was delighted by that. But on virtually everything else, you know, one of the reasons that the House of Commons is never in the news, apart from the, sort of the weekly theatre of PMQs, is they don't debate or vote on anything that actually affects British industry or business at all. We've surrendered everything over employment legislation, over environmental law, and under the, under the auspices of a single market, you know, products, packaging, and all of these things are decided at the EU level. And it's about time we had some more honesty, frankly, with this debate. But why, why don't you think that ministers in the coalition government are raising a stink about this? I mean, the, the, the Prime Minister David Cameron tells us he wants oh, because to the focus a group. The, no, 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 because the focus groups say that the majority of people in Britain don't like smoking and think smoking's bad for you. Well, yes, okay, I'm, 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 I'm with you on that. It, it is a lack of courage. It is a lack of courage to stand up and fight for things. Um, and I've noticed, and I've, I've been in the European Parliament now for 14 years, so I can scarcely believe it. Um, and everything that comes before the Parliament, if it's to do with health, safety at work, or the environment, no matter what debate there is, they'll vote for it. Because these are seen to be good things, and you mustn't question them, and you mustn't challenge them. It's a lack of political courage. But wouldn't it be wise for the Conservatives, who are seeking to present themselves as being fairly Eurosceptic, to have drawn a line in the sand on some of these issues? To say, again, whatever the rights or wrongs, we'll sort this out in the British Department of Health. 
We don't need the director general in Brussels who nobody's ever heard of to, you know, to sort out. But again, we have this myth, don't we? We have this myth that the current Conservative Party is a Eurosceptic party. And yet, I sit next to Martin Caliban, who's the leader of the British Conservatives in the European Parliament, and I know, perfectly nice bloke, gives the odd Eurosceptic speech. And whenever I look at the buttons when we're pressing these wretched <laughs> buttons to vote, mine's red and his is green. And they vote for virtually everything if the legislation is in the name of the single market. Yes, they'll put amendments down. Yes, they'll vote to modify things. Perhaps they'll vote to delay things. But they actually believe in it. And, and the Tobacco Products Directive is one thing, but the really big one was in November 2010, the Conservative Party in the European Parliament, on a three-line whip, voted to transfer management of Britain's biggest single industry, financial services, across to Monsieur Barnier and three new <coughs> European regulatory authorities. And I just, but again, you know, it's very difficult for the British press to actually get them to cover anything that goes on in the European Parliament. To them, it's sort of over there. It doesn't really matter what it does. So, uh, let's imagine your ideal world that the UK has left the European Union. We are now masters of our own destiny. We have a party first. <laughs> right. yeah. Biggest party is the Eden. Trafalgar Square, all the way down the bow, Mars. Right. So, once you've recovered from the party, um, how far do you want to roll some of these things back? I mean, uh, would you, for example, allow television advertising of cigarettes? Would you allow sports sponsorship with Formula One motor racing cars well, in Britain? I, mean, I, 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 I think you're running a bit ahead. What role that, well, I'm running a bit ahead. You've already had your VE Day celebrations on the map. That's what I'm running ahead. Well, what, three years for you? Well, so, so, yeah, so roll ahead to three years. Four years for a day. Maybe less. Okay, roll one day for, for a head. Okay. What sort of uh, agenda have you got on rolling back the stuff? We are, on exiting the European Union, we're going to find ourselves not being subject to any more of their new law, right? But leaving the European Union does not solve on itself any of the economic or business problems this country faces. We will be left with a, with a rule book of 120,000 pages of closed type legislation, which is EU law through directives and regulations that have been incorporated over 40 years in a British law. And what we're going to have to do is to go through that. It'll take two parliaments, in my view. We'll have to go through that, see which bits of it are vaguely sensible, and we, you know, we might want to do anyway, and see which bits of it we want to get rid of. And the absolute priority, I would say, for a British government is to go first for the pieces of EU law incorporated into UK law that are doing the most damage to the British economy. And I can think of the Working Time Directive, and particularly the impact it's having on the National Health Service. I can also think of the Agency Workers Directive. I would say employment law would be a bigger priority than thinking about what to do with advertising rules. Okay. That's not to say that it doesn't matter, but it will be about the <coughs> but, but why is it going to take you two parliaments to go through this? I mean, why wouldn't you just say, set a sunset clause that here is the 120,000 pages, uh, unless you say otherwise, it lacks us in two years' time? Because for 40 years, virtually every single piece of legislation that controls the economic activity and tradeability of this country has been made somewhere else. It will take a long time to go through this. But what fun! We can have two parliaments, <laughs> at the end of which, they haven't made laws, they've repealed hundreds of them. Yeah. And, I, and I find that quite attractive. Um, on, on another issue, which you've, uh, I've occasionally heard you be quite uns uh, outspoken about. No, I'm sure. Uh, yeah, particularly outspoken. And again, yeah. I'm going to question whether uh, the leader of UKIP is necessarily at one with his party. The war on drugs. Ah. Um, uh, should we be moving towards, you know, there'll be a whole loads of international protocols that prevent us, but if uh, Britain's national sovereignty was in its own hands, do you agree with Mike Barton from the Durham Police Force who said, well, we've got to move to decriminalisation? And, you, and is, is, whatever your views, what are the views of the UK independence party? Uh, the UK view on drugs is much the same as the Tory view, the Lib Dem view, and the Labour view. That is the view of the party, and I don't see that changing in a hurry. That is not my view. Uh, I think every year when we hear this, uh, this nonsense spouted about the war on drugs, we're going to raise the level of the war on drugs. Well, frankly, we are whistling in the wind. We lost this war a very, very long time ago. And now a huge percentage of crime, crime against the person, crime against property, uh, the things that upset and ruin the lives of millions, whole estates where people live, being dominated by a couple of families um, who of course are in charge of the dealing. 
Uh, I think that drugs are an absolute blight on this country, a blight socially, a blight economically, a, a blight in our prisons, a, a massive waste of police time and of court time, uh, and we're losing. We're making no progress at all. Uh, and I think a different approach uh, would be the effective decriminalisation of drugs, uh, and in doing so, attempting to take the criminals out of this game. And I think if we did that, it's rather like, you know, there would have been no Al Capone without prohibition in America. And that, I think, is true, uh, particularly most of our big cities in this country, where the drugs gangs are now running the thing uh, and causing absolute endless misery. And I've, I've been of that view, Mark, for some years. I haven't convinced my own party of it. Uh, but I think, and we've seen this with the police commissioner, I think people recoil. You know, they hear someone saying this, and they recoil. But I promise you, year by year, the numbers of people supporting this approach, as opposed to the current failing approach, is growing. And so you're confident you will be able to convert your party to a position of more liberal policy on drugs? Um, changing the views of UKIPers is um, <laughs> <laughs> never easy. Okay, and then everybody understand it's one of the rules of that's an understatement. It's, uh, anyway, anyway. it's one of the rules of interviewing politicians that I have to ask you this as well. But it seems to me all politicians in Britain have the same answer when you ask them personally. Have they ever taken any illegal drugs? They always said, they always said yeah, I did once when I was at university. <laughs> I didn't and, that. and I had to. Um, you're going to give me a more interesting answer than that, aren't you? <laughs> well, I don't really like these confessionals uh, because they can keep on going. Yeah, we're all friends. But I, you know, oh, I, bet. <laughs> no, I, don't, I don't really like confessionals. Um, but I'm going to say this to you that um, I always been a drinker and smoker, and I generally reckoned in my late teens that uh, probably I was doing enough of these things uh, without needing uh, to go for something, a temptation that if I like that as well might lead to terrible trouble, and actually I've never ever even had one puff of a joint, I've never touched drugs at all, it's one part of my life I've said no to, it's a line I've never crossed, and given my behaviour with everything else, thank goodness for that. <laughs> so, maybe your drugs did work for the young Nigel Farage. <laughs> if it work well, no, it was just a judgement, you know, and I could see that once people get onto this, it costs a fortune, it leads to all sorts of problems, and uh, no, no, never did it, I'm, and I'm very pleased about it. Um, just in terms of the overall sort of uh, classical liberal approach of UK, I just want to read you a quote. Uh, libertarianism is like a snake that ends up eating its own tail. It advocates social liberalism as an antidote to authoritarianism. But the only way to deal with the consequences of that runaway social liberal, li liberalism are authoritarian countermeasures. So says Michael McNabbs, one of your prospective European candidates. Doesn't, I mean, I don't know quite well, but he was well, chap. Yeah. Doesn't that indicate that actually, uh, other than your leadership, behind you in the party is a much more authoritarian UK that doesn't really show No, I wouldn't say authoritarian. Absolutely not. Uh, but there will be some people in UK who are more socially conservative than I am. Yes, that is certainly true. And all political parties are an amalgam, you know, of different ideas on, on, on some issues, but on the really big ticket issues, that you give us united. We want our country back from Brussels and to govern ourselves. We want immigration to be at a sensible, manageable, containable level that is a net benefit for this country. We want the government to have less say in our lives. You know, and again, that's a consistent theme that goes through UK. You know, we believe that without free enterprise and business, you can't have schools and hospitals and all the rest. And these are things that we agree on. So I'm not going to get particularly drawn because one of our 73 Euro election candidates doesn't like libertarianism. Okay, well, can you, uh, can you explain to me now what UKIP's policy is on, um, on the burqa ban? I mean, the, your, well, your, web, your website says you're a UKIP is a uh, non racist libertarian party, uh, but you were dabbling with very interesting. I mean, I mean, here is, yet, here is yet another issue that UKIP dares to talk about, gets a whole load of flack for it, and then a couple of years down the road, everyone's talking about it. The problem, you them, the problem, no, the problem with the Burke about uh, concept is that it was completely misconstrued. It was one of the areas where, you know, Lord Pearson and I 
really badly disagreed. I'm not going to say he fell out. I couldn't fall out of my mouth. I've got too much admiration for him. And, and, many, and many of the good things that he's done in public life in this country. But Malcolm was of the view that the burger should be back in full stop. And I was of the view, and, and the party now is convinced of the view, uh, that we should not tell people you know, what to wear walking down the high street or in the park. But that, at school, and at the airport, and going around London underground, you know, we need to have one set of rules that applies equally for everybody. Now, we weren't frightened to say that actually, that you know, facial coverings at that level did make other members, um, you know, at school and places like that, feel uncomfortable. Um, and, and that there were some elements of security risk to it as well. So we got ourselves in a slight mess as to what we, re as to what we really meant by it. Um, but, 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 but where we are now is we would not support a ban on people choosing to wear this walking down the high street or in, or, or in a public park. There must be a quality between people elsewhere. And that's our mainstream view. Okay. Uh, let me uh, take you up on, I guess, what some people might consider to be fairly cosmopolitan liberal issues. Can you explain UKIP's position on gay marriage? Why should homosexuals have different yeah, we, to have We did a submission. We put a submission in to the government on this, in my name, entitled, Gay Marriage is Illiberal. And the point was this. We've got civil partnerships. They've worked actually remarkably well. Um, nobody can argue uh, that homosexuals are now being discriminated against in terms of recognition. But that all the while, we're under the auspices of the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg, we face a very real risk. If a registry office can conduct, which, which is, I was going to say an organ of the state, but that's wrong really, isn't it, in this context, but it's a state registered office, <laughs> he got it anyway, <laughs> the a state registered office can conduct something called marriage, then surely if a state registered church, don't forget we do have a state registered church, it is the Anglican church, if the state registered church was to say no, then before you can say Jack Robinson, you'll be up before the European Court of Human Rights on a charge that the British system is discriminatory. That's how the easy get child works. It doesn't compare country to country, it, 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 it actually works on the equal application of rules within one country. And so there's, a, I think, a very real risk that we'll get one of those cases, and that the Church of England will find itself, as a state registered church, forced against the will of the vast majority of its vicars um, and its congregation, will find itself forced to conduct ceremonies that are called marriage, and we're back to the point about liberty, aren't we? We're back to the point about freedom of conscience. This should be a two-way street, and we should not discriminate through law, potentially, against the Christian community uh, in favour of, of the gay community. Tolerance is a two-way street, and all the while we're under ECHR, gay marriage is, in my view, a step too far. Okay.